sometimes the hardest thing for me to do was to help my doctor clients and say, hey, guys, speak English. You know, you're getting too deep into doctorese there. Uh, speak so everybody, A, understands you. B, is inspired by what you're saying, excited by what you're saying sees new possibilities as a result of what you're saying for their particular health issue and is willing to do something about it. Pick up the phone, call, make an appointment. Paging Dr. Cook. Paging Dr. Cook. Dr. Cook, you're wanted in the OR. Dr. Cook, you're wanted in the OR. Welcome to the Prescription for Success podcast with your host, Dr. Randy Cook. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Prescription for Success. I'm Dr. Randy Cook, your host for the podcast, which is a production of MG Coaches, providing leadership and executive coaching for physicians by physicians to overcome burnout transition your career, develop as a leader, or whatever your goal might be, visit MD Coaches on the web at mymdcoaches.com because you're not in this alone. Today, I'm really excited to be speaking with a former broadcast journalist with many years' experience on such platforms as CNN, ABC, and C-SPAN, among others, He is now a globally recognized communications trainer in a variety of professional settings, including physicians. I think you'll find what he has to say very compelling. So let's hear my conversation with Bob Berkowitz. What a great pleasure it is for me to be having a conversation with Bob Berkowitz, uh, who is uh, speaking to us from... Uh, up in Long Island today. How you doing, Bob? I'm doing well, Randy. Great to speak to you, too. Great to have you here. I say up in uh, Long Island because I'm down in Alabama. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, it's really great to have you on the show. As you already know, and for the benefit of our guest, I'll just mention uh, that you are what we call a special interest guest. Uh, and that simply means that you are not a physician, but uh, because of what you do, physicians, I think, should be interested in you because we're going to talk about communications. Uh, You identify yourself as a communications trainer, as I understand. And uh, I want to hear a lot about that. But before we get there, I want to do exactly what we do with our physician guests and talk a little bit about your background. I understand from our previous conversation that you have a background uh, from long ago in radio, I presume back in the uh, vacuum tube days, just as I do. <laughs> so tell us how you got started in uh, communications. Well, I started doing talk radio uh, when I was in college. I worked at the professional radio station in Denver, and uh, I was working there during the weekend in San Francisco on the talk radio station there on the weekends. And my boss in San Francisco was asked to start a new radio network called the Associated Press Radio Network. After 150, really? yes, after 150 years in the in the news business, the AP thought this radio thing was here to stay. So they, <laughs> they established a radio network. So uh, which you was, were part of the beginning of, of Associated Press Radio. I was. In, Man. In, we, were ba- we were based in Washington, so I moved from Denver to D.C., and I started out as, an, as a uh, news editor. Then I became a uh, Senate and political correspondent for the AP, but I did I a lot of other stories. the presence of greatness. That's I incredible. doubt that. Uh, you must be, somebody else must be in the room with you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but do go ahead. Then, then, but I did not only uh, cover the U.S. Senate and a lot of politics. I covered uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's campaign in 76, Ronald Reagan's campaign yeah. in 1980, but I also did uh, cover the Falklands War in Argentina, Three Mile Island accident in Pennsylvania, Forest fires, floods, floods in Louisiana. Boy, what's going on uh, with the hurricane certainly brings back those yeah. memories for me, at least. You've kind of seen it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I did I worked for AP Radio for seven years. And then when I was up covering the New Hampshire primary, a guy calls me up and says, have you ever heard of Ted Turner? 
I said, yeah, of course, a printer tip. Ha. Huh. And he's starting something called the Cable News Network, CNN. He said, would you be interested in talking to us about being a reporter for CNN? I said, sure, but I've got a few more campaigns to cover. When, when I, I'm done, I'll come down and we'll, we'll talk. And I did. And I joined CNN two months before we went on the air in, in 1980. CNN started June 1st, 1980. And I was there for a couple of months already. And I started out, again, covering the Senate and politics. And uh, they had me covering the Reagan campaign. And after Reagan won, I got a call in my hotel room uh, at the Century City Plaza in Los Angeles. And my boss in Washington woke me up very early in the morning and said, listen, would you be up for covering Reagan at the White House? And now, I have to tell you, Randy, I never was a big fan of being a White House correspondent. I didn't think really? it was as interesting and as challenging as being, let's say, covering the U.S. Senate because you're dealing with a hundred different senators, different points of view, different sources within the Senate staffs. I see but, your point, but I really didn't have much of a choice <laughs> to take the truth. But now, let me ask you this: Don't 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 you think that uh, that that was uh, somewhat of a different attitude on your part? Because even though the uh, the wheels of government were actually being turned in the Capitol. The visibility was at the White House. Yes, so it was. If you wanted and I, to be a big media guy, why wouldn't you go for the White yeah. House? But I see your point. And I'm glad I did go to the White House. I'm glad my bosses sort of pushed me in that direction. It was it was very it was an exciting beat to cover uh, the first uh, several years of the Reagan presidency. Unfortunately, I was also there the day that President Reagan was shot. And uh, that was very upsetting for for all of us around there. But we had a job to do. We had to cover the assassination attempt on the president of the United States. And we did. Yeah. And uh, it was it was, you know, you hope never have to see anything like that again. But you have to do your work. Well, you know, in in being involved with two organizations with the uh, repute of both AP and CNN, uh, you unquestionably have had a truly up close and personal experience with history. Were you aware of that? that I mean, when you, when you go to work every day, did you think, uh, you know, I, I am literally a part of writing the history books uh, that are going to be read a uh, hundred years from now? Several times a week, I would be in the Oval Office. The president would have a little briefing or that we'd have a, a photo op, you know, we'd get a chance to the president, take a picture of the president when he was sitting talking to some visiting head of state or some other individual. And every time I was in that room, I never took it for granted the history that was made in that room. It's not a huge room. It's, you know, maybe think of a big hotel room or hotel suite. And that's the size of the Oval Office. But I, I you know, this is where Lincoln sat, both Roosevelt's, uh, where decisions about war and peace were made. Richard Nixon resigned from from that room. Uh, Absolutely. You know, I mean, it was just, to me, it was just, every time I walked in there, I, I felt a sense of awe and like a chill went up and down my spine. I never took it for granted, never got blasé about it. It was always thrilling to be in that room and to be, you know, within speaking distance of the president of the United States. I guess that I, I'm sure excited doesn't even begin to describe uh, what you were going through at that time. But that it really excited me. I don't think it excited President Reagan that much. He was used to be. That was his office, so he was he was okay yeah. with it. But but it, it it was it was it was a thrill, I have to say. And and even walking through the northwest gate of the White House every morning on my way to work, I, it was it was exciting to me. You know, I, I, I never I never knew what we were going to do that day. To me, the best thing about being a reporter, for me at least, Randy was that it was like always going to graduate school. I was learning something new every single mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. uh, one day would be about foreign policy. The next day it would be about the economy. The next day after that, it was about politics. It was, it was an ongoing education, which, I, I again, I loved. I, I can understand that. And uh, that, uh, you know, for physicians, uh, I think we feel like we live that life because uh, the nature of science changes every day. Totally. But totally. you, my goodness, were uh, watching the evolution of history. And I can't imagine that wouldn't just be thrilling every time you get out of bed in the morning. You know, it was. It was thrilling. And, and the one I learned a lot about medicine 
to that unfortunate experience of President Reagan being shot. Mm -hmm. uh, after he was shot, I was assigned to go over to uh, George Washington University Hospital where the president was. And I learned a lot about gunshot wounds, about recovery. <laughs> I bet you did. Things like that. And yeah. most people don't know that if that bullet shot by John Hinckley had been about an eighth of an inch over, President Reagan would have been dead instantly. You bet. He would have been dead instantly. It's all about millimeters when you're yeah, talking about exactly. penetrating trauma. It sure exactly. is. What, on, on a lighter note, if, if there is such a thing when you're talking about uh, an attempt on the president's life, I one of my sources who was in the emergency room where the president was brought, he wasn't brought in an ambulance. He was brought in the backseat of right. his, his limousine. And two Secret Service agents got him out of the car. Uh, at first, he didn't know he was shot. When he was shoved into the car by the Secret Service agent at the Hilton Hotel, uh, the edge of the door hit him in the chest by accident, <laughs> obviously. And he yeah. thought that was the pain that he was feeling in his chest, not oh the bullet. goodness. And so he, he was not really carried, but almost, you know, he had his arms around both of these burly Secret Service agents being brought into the emergency room. They put him on a gurney and did what they would do to any gunshot wound in the District of Columbia at a major hospital is that they took a knife and they cut open his clothes. Right. <laughs> they didn't treat him like, you know, with the deference that you would normally give a That's president of the United States. You just do. They, they needed to find where he was shot, That's where true. the bullet wounds were. And they did very quickly and they got him into surgery very fast after that. Uh, it gives me chills to think about uh, what it must have been like to be uh, in your shoes. And uh, obviously, uh, that's something that you will never, ever forget the details I of. I won't. That um, is for sure. But uh, let's hear more. Uh, you uh, thought, were you still with CNN at that time? or were you Yes, I was, I was with CNN. I was still with CNN. And I, I spent two years at CNN, and I got a call from ABC News wanting to know if I would talk about going to work for them as a reporter. Mm -hmm. And they they discussed the idea of me staying at the White House for ABC, but I would have been under Sam Donaldson, who was a great reporter, but not the easiest person to be working under. Uh, so I, I decided to know. Really? Said, yeah. He, 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 Are you willing to tell me tell us more about that? This is the well, kind of stuff I, I, I get, love to hear. I, I get along great with Sam. I really did. I thought, you know, he's, he's a really a great reporter, not a good reporter, a great reporter. Sure. Uh, Sam was disliked at the Reagan White House because he asked very tough questions. By the White House uh, staff. Yeah, yeah, by the staff. I think Reagan liked him a lot. And I think yeah. Nancy Reagan liked him a lot. But I don't yeah. think the White House staff, his top people, uh, Ed Meese, Jim Baker, uh, folks like yeah. that, they didn't, they didn't like Sam. And so what Sam did is that he would cultivate sources on Capitol Hill of both parties, both Democrats and Republicans, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. mainly Republicans who wanted to send a message to their president. And so mm -hmm. he got great sources outside of the White House. And it was a great lesson for me uh, as bet. a reporter is that don't depend on always on the immediate sources. The immediate sources within the White House, they're going to do everything they can to protect the president as yeah. they should. That's Follow the script. I say yes and no to that. Yes, that's why they were hired is to protect the president, to make the president look good. On the other hand, Randy, we as taxpayers are paying their salary. They're not being paid by the president. They're not PR people who are on the private sector payroll. Good point. They're, they're, they're being paid by us. And so they are our servants, not necessarily the servants of the government or the president. So I have mixed feelings about that. But you know, the reality is they're there to protect the president. I and to make understand. him look good. Yeah. And to make him look good. And I understand that. That's the game. So at ABC, you uh, moved? To New York. To New York. And I what moved was the New job York. there? I was a general assignment correspondent for, a, for ABC based in New York. And I went around the world covering stories, uh, some wars, uh, natural disasters, things like that, which was honestly, Randy, it was okay. I'm not complaining. I got paid a fair amount of money to do what I like to do. But- the beat itself was not as interesting to me as covering the president. I said to myself, I need to do something different. I need to do something that's, for me personally, exciting, challenging, 
interesting. And oh yeah, by the way, like every reporter, I wanted my own unique beat. <laughs> so I talked to my, my dad. I said, it was, a, it was a great psychoanalyst, brilliant guy. I said, I told him what my situation was. And he says, well, you know, think of something you want to do that would be exciting, but be open-minded about it before you go to, go to sleep at night, just before you're ready to really conk out for the night. Ask yourself, what could be a great idea for me to do something interesting, challenging, exciting, and that would be my own beat. What my father was telling me to do is to ask my unconscious mind, my subconscious mind, to, to sort of act as a, a radar, a, a psychological radar, and to look within myself and outside of myself to find something interesting. I'm curious. You, you mentioned that your dad was a psychoanalyst. Was was yep. he actually a physician? Was he a psychiatrist? No, he was a psychoanalyst. He he um, he was a New York City cop, and while he was a police officer, and my mother was a New York City cop also. Uh, huh. My mother's career as a cop ended when she became pregnant with me. Understandable. Uh, yeah, I was. Believe me, I was enough for her. <laughs> she had enough work on her hands just carrying me around for nine months and then then uh, giving birth. Uh, but my dad, while he was a New York City cop, pulling an eight-hour shift with two young children at home, my brother was seven and a half years older than me. I was an infant. He was also getting his master's at Columbia in psychology. And I'll be darned. So he, he was a hard worker, my dad. And he, after he got his master's, he quit the police department and went on to get his PhD from NYU in psychoanalysis. What a and, great story. Yeah. Well, he was, he was a brilliant guy. He really was a brilliant guy. I think about him all the time. I bet you do. Yeah, he was a great and guy. it sounds too. like he had a great influence on you. He did. He did. So what he said to me when he was having that phone conversation about, you know, plant the seed in your subconscious mind, plant that seed of possibility in your subconscious mind. He says, now, listen, Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, just think your old man's lost his marbles and go on with your life. <laughs> I said, okay, dad, I will. And, but I did it. And the next day I woke up, there was no grand epiphany, Randy, no bolt of lightning hit me in my bed as I was drinking my morning coffee. But I turned on the Today Show and I saw a woman, actually, I knew this woman who's a reporter. She was doing something called Today's Woman. And she was reporting on stories affecting women and how women were changing and how women were reacting to that change. And suddenly the bolt of lightning did hit me. If she's doing today's woman, I'm going to report on today's man. If women were changing, men had to react to that. Men were changing too. I really felt that and I believe that. That's brilliant. And so I pitched this idea to a friend of mine who was a big time correspondent at, at NBC and he says, I'm going to take it to Steve Friedman, who was the executive producer of the Today Show, and see what he thinks. And I got a call from Friedman's assistant saying, can you come in to talk to Steve? I said, sure. And Steve said, and I came in with all my audition tapes, all these wonderful stories I've done for all the networks, ABC, CNN, blah, blah, blah. He says, put that away. I'm not interested in that. <laughs> Tell me about your idea. I told him about the idea. He says, you're hired. He says, somebody from business affairs will contact you about a contract. And so I did. It was, uh, it, it started me on the adventure. So I became the men's correspondent for the Today Show. It was just so much fun for me because it was everything I wanted to do, Randy. It yeah. was exciting, interesting, challenging, and nobody in the world was doing it except me. And that was uh, during what years, what time frame? Oh, that was in the mid 80s, mid to late 80s. Tell us what that was like. What, what, uh, tell us about the show and how it was received and what it did for you. I'll give you some examples of the stories that I did. Well, let me just preface it by saying when anybody loses a job, it's hurt, it hurts. It's painful. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a blow to your self-esteem. It's, it's just not a good thing. It's very, very uncomfortable. But to take it a step further, I believe it's more difficult for men than it is for women. Not that women don't feel pain and hurt and embarrassment, mm -hmm. et cetera, just as men do. But when a man loses a job, he feels like he's failed as a man. It's not just mm -hmm. he failed as a carpenter, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever he did, he failed as a man. A woman doesn't feel that way. She feels maybe she failed as whatever her lawyer, doctor, whatever, executive, but she, she doesn't feel like a failure as a woman. There may be other areas where she might feel like a failure as a woman, but not in this context of losing a job. 
And so I, I focused on the pain that men go through when they get canned, when they get fired, they get laid it's off. It's a very interesting insight. Yeah. And something that I, it wasn't being talked about then. And I, I think it still doesn't get uh, a lot of airtime. No, it doesn't. It really, there are a lot of things that don't get a lot of airtime that I, that, that, that have to do with medicine and doctors, which I'll be more than happy to talk to you about. And I can imagine that the, the, the response that you got from the male audience was fairly profound. And it was. I should think. He, he, the men would write in saying, thank God somebody's listening to me. Somebody yeah, hears me. Somebody understands what it's like to go through what I'm going through now. And some women, I have to say, got a little angry at me by saying, mm -hmm. wait a minute. I was hurt when I got fired. I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. I, and I said, I understand that. I totally get that. And mm -hmm. how could you feel otherwise? But did you feel like you were less of a woman? They said, no. I said, that's the point. And many women wrote in and said, okay, now I see what my husband's going through. Now I see why he's in such pain and why he's depressed, frankly. This is such an interesting insight that you're talking about right there. Uh, and that is, uh, you, you had this idea at a time when people thought men don't have any reason to have any problems. It seems to me that in 21st century America, we have seen, you know, we call it polarization. But to me, it seems much more like scattering because it's not like there are two extremes. There are many extremes. We have different groups, different cultures, uh, different ethnic persuasions, different professions, different races, uh, and they all seem to feel like they're not getting enough attention. Is that similar to the reaction that you got from the women when you were talking about the problems of men? Well, a lot of women would say, and I understand what, what they were saying, they said, you know, men have problems, really? I mean, you know, they're making so much mm -hmm. more money than we are. They have access to better positions. And, and they were right. Which men true. were making men were making more money and probably still are. And and when I, it's really funny is that I used to go to the White House briefings every day when I was a CNN White House correspondent. And I understood what that was like. I'm, mm -hmm. When I watch the White House briefings on TV, on CNN or MSNBC or Fox, whatever, what jumps out of the TV screen to me is it's still white male dominated the White House press corps. It is. Yes, there are some women. Yes, there are some people of color, but overwhelmingly it's white male. So some things really haven't changed. And so I understand why women would say, what problems exactly are you reporting on for men? Here's what I would tell them. <laughs> Here's what I would tell them. I said, men have much of the same pain, maybe in a different way as women do. Women have permission in our culture to articulate that pain, that, that mm -hmm. suffering, that, uh, that anxiety, and men don't. And men hide their pain from everybody else in the world. And it, it comes out one way or another. Men are five times more likely to attempt suicide than women. Men are far more likely to feel clinical depression than women. So it's, it, that pain's got to go somewhere, Randy. Sure. And if they're internalizing the pain, well, gosh, I mean, it's going to, you know, some way, one way or another, it's going to, it's going to, you know, cause suffering within that guy, within that man. Now, I have to say, not all of the topics that I covered uh, as the men's correspondent of today's show were that heavy or that, of that manner. I, for example, went to Norway, where the prime minister of the country at the time was a woman, and her husband was the chief columnist for the number one newspaper in Oslo. And he, part of his job was to criticize his wife. And she, but, and she <laughs> oh was the, gosh. but she was the most powerful person in that country. And it Boy, made I'm for- I didn't it, have that job. <laughs> exactly. It made for a really interesting marital dynamic. First of all, she was more powerful than he was. Yeah. And also part of his job was to sometimes take some some journalistic shots at his wife, compliment her too, of course, when she did something that he liked. But also, if he was being an honest journalist, an honest columnist, honest opinion person, to say, I think she's messing up here. And so it made for a really interesting story. And they were a wonderful couple. And they had a great marriage, really terrific marriage. And, and, and he, she was a physician and he was a physician. And they both met, even though they're both Norwegian and they'd never known each other in Norway, they both met at Harvard Medical School. Remember medical school? 
You are confident, studious, hardworking, and you learn what to expect in all manner of patient care. Then reality struck. Regulations, expenses, staff management, and administration. Is this what we signed up for? Stress on the verge of burnout? No time for family or the reason we got into medicine? Helping people. What are the options when you're afraid you're in the wrong career? Transition? Teach? Quit? What if there was another way? MD coaches can help. We're a team of medical professionals with a century of experience in the clinical and business sides of medicine. More importantly, MD Coaches has been where you are, stressed and trying to navigate a world school didn't prepare us for. MD Coaches is your mentor, your confidant, to help you make your practice shine, navigate administrations, and successfully lead staff and projects. Or if you're ready to transition, we can help there too. MD Coaches is doctors helping doctors. Visit our website to receive a free, no-obligation consultation. Go to mymdcoaches.com forward slash rx. That's mymdcoaches.com forward slash rx. Isn't it time someone else was on your side? Don't let the business of being a doctor stop you from doing what you love. That site again? mymdcoaches.com forward slash rx. Visit us today. We'll get back to our interview in just a moment. But right now, I want to tell you a little bit about Physician Outlook. If you haven't discovered this remarkable magazine, please do so very soon. It was created by physicians for physicians to showcase the intersection between clinical and non-clinical interests, whether it's writing, painting, cooking, politics, and dozens of other topics. Physician Outlook gives a physician perspective. It's available online and in print. It's really unique among physician lifestyle magazines. And like the Prescription for Success podcast, Physician Outlook amplifies the voice of any physician who has something to say. It also engages patients who still believe in physician-led, team-based care. And Prescription for Success listeners can get three months free when you enter our promo code rx for success and select the monthly option at checkout. That's a really great deal on this stunning publication. And now let's get back to today's interview. Well, let's let, let's go ahead and talk more about uh, uh, your tenure at uh, CNBC and, and and if you want to go ahead and get us into what came next. Sure. Uh, at CNBC, I did a talk show. Are you ready for this? About sex. <laughs> did you have to have credentials I did. for that? I, no. You know what my credential was? I'm a very good asker of questions. And <laughs> I didn't have to be the expert. I had experts on, but the f- real beauty of the show, yes, the, the experts, the uh, therapists, the physicians, the scientists we had on there added tremendous expertise and credibility to whatever the subject was that night. But I believe the gold in the show, Randy, was the people. These were rather average Americans who were kind enough, courageous enough, generous enough to talk about something that we rarely speak about in public, much less on national television. And, and I, I so, I'm so grateful for them for doing it. And the audience resonated with them. The audience connected with them. The audience said, oh, they look and sound like me. And what I love to tell people about the demographics of our audience, what would you guess would be on a per capita basis, the number one and number two markets for a national show about sex. Now, the, uh, in raw numbers, it would be New York and Los Angeles, the two biggest markets in the country. Okay, we all get that. But on a per capita basis, what would you say to be the, the number one and the number two markets? Hmm. That's a hard one. But frankly, I'm, I'm sort of inclined to, to think that there might be a pretty good market in rural America. But I, wanna, I want you to go ahead and give me the answer. Please. It was the number one market was Salt Lake City. And the number two market was Oklahoma City. Holy cow. So we got the Mormons and the Baptists all wrapped up in uh, one good package. Well, you and, know, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, it, it did make sense. And and it, when my wife and I went out to Utah for a vacation and we were, we were sitting at a restaurant and it was not unusual for people to come up and recognize me and say, you know, I like your show or whatever. And that, it's always nice to hear that. Some, some guy came up to me and says, 
I don't know who you are and I never watch your show and don't tell my wife that I came to say hello to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. So it, but it, it, it was a great, it was very gratifying doing that show. It was, uh, it was interesting. It was fun. And we, we did that for four years. And then from there, sounds uh, like it might've been ahead of its time as it, well. Well, not really. We had the number one ratings on CNBC, so we had an audience for it. Well, and, and that was the other thing that I was going to ask you about. And um, uh, there, there, there is a lot that I don't know about CNBC, and I would certainly have never guessed that there would be programming directed at a discussion of sex behavior. Well, in, in, in those days, day, dur- during the day, they had business programming as you see today. Sure. Same, same as it is today, stock market focused programming. And that's, they did a great job. They still do a great job. I, I'm, a, I'm a viewer and a fan of, of, of CNBC. At night though, they figured, hey, even the most hardcore investor wants to see something a little different. Mm-hmm. And so I was on in part of the primetime lineup. Our lineup included Tom Snyder, Dear, dear man, who was my mentor and and a friend. I was glad Phil Donahue, uh, Geraldo Rivera, Dick Cavett. These were the people I was sharing the primetime lineup with. And it was an honor to be around them. I admire them so much, all of them, in many ways. And so that's that's was the thinking at, at CNBC is that during the day, yeah, business news is primo. But at night, it was going to be about something different, a little bit more human-oriented, if you will. I took all that I learned about communications and media, and I set up a business being a media trainer. And what that means is I would talk, let's, for example, I had, given your line of work, I had a half a dozen hospitals as clients. These hospitals, they were in places like Bridgeport, Connecticut, Stanford, Connecticut, all around, particularly in the Northeast, New York City. These hospitals, frankly, needed to attract more patients. And so they felt, and correctly so, that by having a presence in the media, being interviewed by some TV station uh, or network or newspaper or blog or podcast, they could make their case to the folks out there that if you've got a medical issue, if you've got a health challenge, we're the place you need to go to get, Mm -hmm. get help. And it was successful. Uh, I trained a lot of doctors on on how to make their case on behalf of not only the hospital, but their practice as well. A lot of doctors then came to me as individuals and said, listen, I've got a practice here. There are three or four of us physicians. We're a dermatology practice or an OBGYN practice. And we want to have more patients. You know, and But we think that if we are interviewed by the New York Times or 60 Minutes or, or CNN or whomever, we have a chance for people to say to themselves, wow, these folks are pretty smart. They understand their field of medicine really well. They speak English, if you will. That's (laughs) sometimes the hardest thing for me to do was to help my doctor clients say, hey, guys, speak English. You know, you're getting too deep into doctorese there. Uh, Speak so everybody, A, understands you. B, is inspired by what you're saying, excited by what you're saying sees new possibilities as a result of what you're saying for their particular health issue and is willing to do something about it. Pick up the phone, call, make an appointment. So you became a communications trainer. Yep. And um, what was that evolution like? Did you just wake up one day and say, so long CNBC, I'm going to do, go do something yep. entirely. I, I did it on my own. Different. I set up my own company and I did it. And, and it, it got to the point where, where I was not only doing media training for hospitals and doctors and practices, but I was also working with some hospitals who said, listen, we got really smart docs and really terrific nurses and, and medical technicians, but sometimes they have a hard time communicating with each other. And so I helped break down those communication barriers for these wonderful healthcare professionals. And so they were more effective. Patients were getting better care. They were working better as a team, more smoothly, more productively. Uh, And it, it was, it was a help to everybody. Every, it was a win-win for everybody. And can you tell me a little bit more about, um, 
sort of the nuts and bolts of how you did that? Did, did, sure. did you show up and say, uh, uh, I, I'm here to uh, do a program or a series of programs to uh, teach your physicians how to connect better with patients? Or how, how did you get the message out that you had something, for lack of a better word, to sell? Well, they came to me, fortunately. Once I was doing the media training for the you know, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 hospitals I was working with, they at some point said, we need some more communications work within our hospital mm -hmm. uh, within or within the practices of some of our docs. Uh, they're, they're having some communications challenges. And you know what? They're no different than everybody else in this respect, Randy. We all tend to overrate our ability to communicate our ideas, our insights, our beliefs. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me give you some, uh, an example from my own life. My wife and I have been together for almost 30 years, and we can practically finish each other's sentences. We know each other that well. <laughs> Yet there are times when I know I've said something to Susan, which I thought I was being unbelievably clear about, but she evidently did not get, and the opposite is true as well. Mm -hmm. So, But we have this really intimate, close relationship when you're in the professional world, you're really talking to strangers, whether it's your colleagues or it's to patients, you're talking to strangers. So what I always urge people to do is to translate and interpret what they mean. So again, going back to my personal life is that, I don't know, maybe you're like me, Randy. I get up in the morning, I stumble into the kitchen, turn the coffee on in the morning, feed my dog. But what I'm also doing is beginning that internal dialogue that does not end until the end of the day, many, many hours later, when I go to sleep that night. And that internal dialogue is fascinating to me, Randy. I understand myself perfectly. I speak Bob Berkowitz fluently. I don't need to go to Burlets, Burlets to understand Bob Berkowitz. I don't need to do anything. Therefore, I might make the mistake that because I understand me perfectly, that Susan or Randy or anybody else in the world understands me just as well, just as easily. And that's generally not the case. And I, that's why I always believe that we need to interpret, translate, tell stories or create narratives about what we mean. So people say to themselves, yes, I understand what Bob means, what Randy means, or anybody else. That's very insightful, obviously. You, you knew that. I mean, uh, I, I don't think there is anybody who has not had the experience of speaking to a spouse or anybody else for that matter. And the person who is receiving the communication is offended. And they say, but you just said so and so and so and so and so. And then the response from the opposite pole is, no, that's not what I said at all. I meant nothing of the kind. Yeah, I didn't mean that. That's not what I meant. And so that's why it's important to take those extra steps, Randy, to make sure you're being as clear as you possibly can be. And so you've discovered that this is something that can actually be taught. But if you want to be taught, <laughs> you, you said to me, how do I go about, you know, pitching myself or selling myself mm -hmm. to doctors, practices, or hospitals? And I said, most of the time they came to me. Now, there are times when the head of the hospital, the CEO of the hospital came to me and said, hey, Bob, we have this really brilliant surgeon. He is, man, he's a, a, an artist and a wizard with a scalpel, but he does not communicate to his nurses and the patients in a way that we think would be ideal. And they were putting it mildly. And so he said, could you, could you work with that individual? And I said, sure, as long as that person wants to do it. If they don't want to do it, they're going to resist. They're going to not hear me, they're gonna, their mind will be elsewhere while I'm talking, and, but they have to be convinced themselves that's true, what the CEO of the hospital just said. They have to believe that it's holding them back in some way from being the really great surgeon that they can be. A close member of our family, Randy, uh, was diagnosed with oral cancer. She had a, um, a, an issue with her tongue. And we went to, I won't name the hospital. I went with her to one of the most prestigious cancer hospitals, not only in the country, but in the world. And we went to see this doctor who was highly recommended. And he didn't look at her in the eye. He didn't talk. He didn't, 
He looked like he was distracted while she was pouring her heart out about her fears and anxieties about cancer. Mm -hmm. She was worried that she would never talk again. She was worried she might die. She was worried that this cancer might spread from her tongue to other parts of her body. And he seemed so indifferent, so uncaring and unfeeling. I have no doubt that this guy was a brilliant, brilliant specialist. Mm -hmm. But he lost her as a patient because he didn't communicate well or listen very well to her. She found another doctor at a very, very good hospital, but not, not, does not have the prestige, the ranking of this particular cancer hospital. And this doctor is not only a great surgeon, a brilliant oncologist, but he's a real, and I'll use a word in Yiddish, mensch. He's a real <laughs> decent guy, a real human being. Yeah. Because you know, when you're an oncology patient, you're kind of together for the rest of your lives. I you mean, bet. You're, you know, you're 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 a, you're a match. You're a pair. Uh, That's true. Until one of you leaves us. You know, uh, I, I don't know if you're even aware of this, but uh, it's been quite a number of years ago, probably fifteen or twenty years ago. The New England uh, a, a study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine where they um, uh, examined different specialists to, if you could predict uh, which physicians would be the better communicators uh, because of the specialty that they were in. What they determined was that uh, the primary care specialties such as uh, internal medicine and family practice and pediatrics and so forth tended to be far, far better than the surgeons. Have you uh, seen what you would consider to be similar results? I have, except there are some GPs, as they still call them in England, <laughs> internists who are going to deal with a lot of aspects of a patient's health, who sometimes, again, have a hard time communicating their ideas. They're not taking into account the educational level of the patient, the fear of the patient is experiencing in that moment the intimidation mm -hmm. that the patient might be feeling, how honest the patient really is about what's going on in their lives. And, and sometimes some docs, they don't mean to be, but they come off as being judgmental about some patients. And so patients then shut down. They're not as open about some aspects of their lives as, as much as they should be. So there might be some measurable differences between specialties, but mm -hmm. being in a particular specialty doesn't necessarily mark you uh, as a good communicator or a poor communicator. Is That's that right. fair enough? That's right. Yeah. Do, do you find that uh, I, I'm particularly interested uh, in this from the standpoint of uh, having been a surgeon and, uh, and, and because of that article labeled as a, a probable poor communicator, uh, do, do you find that surgeons are coachable? Oh, yes. If they want to be, sure. if they want to be, if they, if they recognize, Hey, listen, I'm not connecting as well as I should to my patients, to my colleagues, to uh, the folks who are in the operating theater with me. I'm just not, I know I need to be better at it. And I know that we'd have better outcomes as a result of it. And I think I heard you say that the converse is also true just because you're uh, in general, internal medicine, it doesn't necessarily mean no. that you're going to be a good communicator. No, it doesn't necessarily mean that at all. And you might well, not be coachable in that as well. Yeah. You know, it's interesting is that when we are poor communicators, it's generally speaking in one area of our professional lives, not necessarily in all areas. Let me give you an example if I can. I have one client who is as brilliant as anybody I've ever met in my life. Uh, and he's as nice as anybody I've ever met in my life to boot. Uh, he's a, a scientist at one of, uh, at a major pharmaceutical company. And his boss, the CEO, called me up and said, you got to work with this guy. He's so terrific and so great, but he has some communications issues. And so I said, sure. And he knew it. The guy that, were, you know, the client knew it. So his issue was, if you were to see him, and I did see him talking to his internal teams at the company, he was brilliant. He was great. They understood what he was saying. He was funny, interesting, uh, and, and really got across a lot of information that was important for them to understand. However, 
if you put him in front of outside groups, the board of directors, investors, the media, customers, he felt rather intimidated. And this guy's credentials were amazing. He shouldn't feel intimidated by anybody or anything, but he did. And so I helped to give him some tools that would help him to communicate in any circumstances better than he ever imagined that he could. And he's now t- today, uh, he's, he speaks in front of, at conferences, at medical conferences. Uh, he talks to the investment community with great confidence. Uh, he's wonderful with customers. And in his context, customers are hospitals who might buy the drugs that his company makes, that he's a part of developing. So he's, I'm very proud of him. And, I, and, I, and I I, he's, just a great, he's such a great guy to boot. It's just a pleasure working with this man. Well, I, I think it's fairly clear from the success of your business uh, and, for, and, and this entire project that you uh, uh, set out to create quite a while ago that, uh, that, that you do uh, have the capability to really make people better communicators. And uh, goodness knows we could use a lot more of that. What I'm going to do at this point, Bob, is uh, what is my favorite part of the show uh, and uh, that is where I take the opportunity just to keep quiet and stay out of your way, uh, if that's okay with you. <laughs> so uh, for the listeners, uh, I expect this is going to be very insightful. Uh, let's listen while Bob Berkowitz gives us his prescriptions for success. Thank you, Randy. I, I specialize in two areas. One is to help my clients to be better communicators and also to help them to make better, smarter decisions or to stop making so many bad decisions as so many of us do. I can never say to you, you'll never make a bad decision, but my job is to help you to reduce the number of poor decisions and to to make better decisions. So let's talk about communications for a moment. Be clear in your mind about what you want to say and to who. Who are they? What do they need to know? What's important for them to know? How do you say what you want to say in a way that's understandable to them. So for example, if you're talking to a medical colleague, another doc, well, you know, you can speak in shorthand to that doctor. You can use all kinds of acronyms and and, and you probably are going to understand each other. But even then, the other physician may not totally understand what you're saying. And that's why it is vitally important to always translate and interpret what you are saying. And one of the phrases that I always urge my clients to use is, here's what I mean by that. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Or here's how I came to this conclusion. Or here's why I believe this is really important for us to know about, for our practice, for our patients, for whatever is your goal. And When you translate and interpret what you're saying, you're giving yourself and the person you're talking to the greatest opportunity to understand what you're saying, why it's important, why it's meaningful. So that's that's something, if you get that in terms of communication, you're going to be way ahead of the game and way ahead of everybody else. The other thing also is to use the kind of language that's appropriate for the person you're talking to. We were talking earlier, you know, patients are lay people. They come into a doctor's office, oftentimes nervous, scared, maybe intimidated. They see you in your white lab coat and stethoscope around your neck and think to myself, oh my God, this is, this is somebody I have a hard time relating to. So it's really important, A, to reassure them, to make them as comfortable as they can be. And remember to be them-oriented. It's not about you, it's about them. How can I communicate my information so, A, they understand me, and B, it's meaningful? And one of the ways is you have to understand what kind of language to use to that patient. How sophisticated are they? What language skills do they have? Is English their first language? Uh, and it's it's vitally important to make sure that, that they understand you and you understand them. So, for example, when they're telling you about their symptoms, about their issues, their problems, their challenges, say, that's really interesting. Can you give me an example of how that plays out in your life or how that feels to you or 
under what circumstances you might have that that issue. If you, so, it's it's really important again to be a good interviewer. I mean, maybe the only thing that I do particularly well in life is I'm I'm a good asker of questions. But so should you be ask questions. And the gold is really not in just asking the right questions, but it's in the follow up question. That's really interesting. Can you tell me more about that? Or why did it happen at that moment? What else was going on in your life, in your relationship, at work? Be a really good in-depth interviewer of your patients. A good, if you'll forgive the uh, the expression, a good talk show host. You know, find out as much as you can about what your patient's life experiences are. And the other area of expertise that I love to work with with clients is making good decisions. I worked with a doctor who was uh, a pediatrician at a, a very, very good hospital in the Northeast. And he was really on the prefaces of, of a change in his life. He wanted to leave the hospital, start his own private practice. But I had to help him to decide how to go about that in the best way, what the trade-offs would be, staying in the hospital, starting out on your own, how to market yourself to patients, how to make sure that a lot of folks knew that, that you were now in private practice, and then it would also help them with what we call presentation trainings. I would urge, I urge this client, listen, you need to get out there. You need to let the world know, or at least your community know, that you're now in private practice as a pediatrician. So speak in front of PTA groups, mothers uh, groups, mom working groups, uh, since moms are usually generally in charge of the health care for their, their kids. But even the Chamber of Commerce, who knows? Who knows what's in the audience? Who's in the audience? And I taught them how to, A, get the audience's attention right at the beginning of your speech. Don't back into the speech. Metaphorically grab them by the lapels. Make sure you have three really important, clear, concise, compelling messages to get across to that audience and why it's important for them to understand it. So that's you know some of the work I do in terms of either communications or decision making for clients, and uh, I love working with doctors because a they're smart, they get it real fast, and uh, they and they find concrete, practical ways to apply what they've learned in the work that we've done together. That is absolutely fabulous, and uh, I'm not even moderately surprised. Uh, you clearly have a way better grasp of how to communicate than most people, I think. And uh, it sounds to me like you're certainly in the right business. And speaking of that, we want to give you an opportunity to tell our audience just exactly where they can find you. So uh, whatever you want to pass along, email addresses, websites, sure. uh, upcoming programs, uh, what you got for us. Please go to my website. BobBerkowitz.com, B-O-B-B-E-R-K-O-W-I-T-Z.com, or feel free to email me, Bob at BobBerkowitz.com. I will answer any email that you send me, any challenges that you have, any problems you have. If you want me to look at a video of a speech you gave, happy to do that. Don't worry about the price. Don't worry about the charge. They'll be not be happy to do it uh, gratis. But I, I look forward to working with you. The other thing I also do, Randy, is that I help people uh, figure out what's stopping them from getting what they want in life and in work. I think we are all the authors of our own success. We also put up our own walls to success, our own stumbling blocks to success. And I help people to see what they're doing in their lives and in their careers and in their practices that are stopping them from having the most fulfilling, enjoyable, profitable, caring practice and life that they possibly can have. Well, Bob, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Um, this fascinates me, and, and I literally could have uh, gone on for hours, but uh, uh, out of respect for your time, we won't try to do that. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us. It's been a great pleasure. The honor has been mine, Randy. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening with us today. And thanks also to Ryan Jones, who composes and performs our theme music for us. We hope you'll follow us on your favorite podcast platform and give us your feedback. It really helps us get better when you leave us a review and hopefully a five-star rating. 
Also, if you'll visit our website at rxforsuccesspodcast.com, you can offer your very own prescription for success on SpeakPipe and maybe hear it played back on one of our future shows. That's all we have time for today, so be sure and fill your prescription for success with my next episode.